Uh, we're here with NUS President um, Liam Burns. Yeah, nice to meet you. Hi there. Hi, Chris. Nice to meet you. Um, we joins us live in the studio. Now, last year we had Aaron Porter come in and um, say a few things of what he thought. Uh, now, you you went to university, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. You study physics, isn't that right? Yeah. So I went to first Glen Rothes College. That's no one ever heard of it. It's in Scotland. <laughs> now Aaron right. Smith, and then I went to Harriet Watt University, which is in Edinburgh. Cool. And you, you were um, the NUS President of Scotland at the time, weren't you? Yes, I was first up in Scotland and then came down here to UK. Right, that's cool. Okay, so the people that are watching now and like listening now, uh, for the, for the <laughs> I forgot about there's a camera. Yeah, there's a camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, for the students, uh, start off, uh, what did you change to the previous person in your position last year? I mean, what did you want to take on when you were re-elected? Well, there was, there, was a few, there was a few changes when I came into election last year. Um, we started being very clear that actually, no, we weren't going to go down a consumerist route of what it meant to have £9,000 fees. Um, and that was a slight shift in direction of where we might have gone. Uh, I think that was the right call, and I think we're winning lots of arguments now about how, yes, students need more power on their campus, and they are essentially funding the system. That does not mean you get to treat us like someone that's walking about Safeway. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. um, the second thing is we, we've talked a lot in the past about how you fund the institution. Very rarely have we talked about how you fund the student. And so we've made a massive focus of student financial support this year. Uh, we've surveyed over 23,000 students from apprentice to postgraduate. Uh, and we're now going into a phase of how do we pull out that from that evidence, the policies that will put more money in students' pockets. And that, I think that is a, uh, the right, a right move to take because at the end of the day, I don't think I could walk onto your campus and find a student who doesn't think that what money they get while they study is a really important thing. Yeah, and you said that you mentioned um, in the presentation that uh, you think that education and having qualifications as a as a lecturer is highly important. Uh, a few people that we've spoken to agree with this. Um, do you like to follow up about and summarise what you mean about that? Yeah, sure. So we, I was here today talking about the concept of qualifications and lecturing, and that comes about from a number of reports from the Brown Review to the White Paper saying that there probably should be qualifications. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, I did a, a article in The Guardian that got some interesting responses, <laughs> shall we say, yeah. um, calling on this idea of qualifications. Now, look, this isn't about because we pay fees, there should be qualifications. I think fees or no fees, we would be talking about the idea of it's kind of right that people are qualified to lecture. Um, anyway, in fact, in Scotland, this is no less of an issue. They don't pay tuition fees. Um, but we have to be careful with what we mean. So. I'm not suggesting that we have a one-size-fits-all for uh, all lecturers across the UK having one qualification. Um, I'm saying that you, there should be a compulsion that you take part in continue professional development. Because at the end of the day, what profession is there that the way you don't have to be qualified and where you don't have to continually update your skills in that area, but other than being a politician or my job, and I think that says all. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Everywhere else, you should have a qualification, I think. There will, of course, be students walking onto campus next year perceiving themselves to pay up to £9,000. Mm -hmm. I think that even though that they're not one in the same issue, we've reached a point where it's no longer tenable not to deal with this issue. Right, OK, yeah. Um, and also, I spoke to several students. Uh, you, you mentioned in the lecture about uh, possibly their students being not satisfied with the, um, the quality in which they lecture and, and they're not giving like, that extra mile, if you will. Um, so yeah, I've had a few people, you know, not satisfied with that. How do you feel about that? I mean, well, look. So first of all, I don't think there's some sort of endemic or bad teaching across the UK. I think it's very much in the minority where there is genuinely bad lecturing. Yeah. Um, but needless to say, when you have lecturers that refuse to do things like use the virtual learning environment or um, do not turn up to the internal training on pedagogy. Um, just read out from a PowerPoint because yeah. they might be excellent, amazing le researchers. That does not automatically mean that they're going to be brilliant lecturers. Mm -hmm. And you know that it's a profession in itself, and you can you can learn it. And I also think that it's incumbent on universities to give the support to be a good lecturer. You need to be good at communication, some form of empathy, some form of emotional intelligence. Um, be able to, uh, to to spot things that I think. I think it's difficult for lecturers to not learn or to, yeah. to not have the support to learn. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm not presuming that across the board there is bad teaching in every university. Yeah. I am saying that we should think about how do we support lecturers to be the best that they can be at it. Yeah. 
and you said with the rise of the fees that um, there was actually, funny enough, there was like no more money going no. into. Yeah, <laughs> there's that. Can we like discuss it to the people? Well, so there's what, one of the frustrations. Yeah, yeah, one of the frustrations that are, that will happen next year. Students will come on saying, "Well, we're paying a whole whack more, perceive them themselves to." Mm -hmm. um, that that doesn't mean there's any more money for universities because actually what hap has happened is the government has withdrawn all the public funding and replaced it with um, income contingent loans. Um, now it's fair to say there's more money in the sector as a whole, much, but there is more money, it's the most funded it ever has been. Yeah. But that money isn't necessarily coming to places like Bournemouth, it's places that have gone to 9k across the board. And so that one of the really difficult things going forward is students are going to be saying we pay more, surely we should get more. Mm. Universities will be saying, well, no, because we don't have any more. Yeah. And that's why we should never lose the big picture. Yes, we should talk about things like the quality of learning and teaching, what protection we have for students in terms of fees that they pay, but we should never lose sight of the fact that this system in itself is rotten <laughs> and we kind of need to get rid of fees um, and that should be our overall goal. Do you think that um, social media has had an impact? I mean, obviously, there's been like all the strikes that have happened like in the last couple of years. But do you think that that uh, we could all come together and make this those social media like happen and change things in campus or outside of university? Has it had an effect on uh, your job and what you've done? Oh, massive effect on my <laughs> job because now, whereas the NUS president would get to Rome about saying what they like and might get an angry email or might you know eventually yeah. get a phone call, yeah. um, I know before I stand off a podium. That someone thinks what I'm saying from it. <laughs> yeah, I've mean, tweeted that multiple it. times, yeah, you know. Yeah. So it certainly changed changed our job and how we work, and everything's faster. So right. we are going to we are going to be organising a national demonstration this year um, against not just the concept of fees, but the first time that people with nine thousand pound fees are on campus, the first generation not to have EMA, a whole generation whether you agree with fees or not that have employment being ripped away from them, and if unemployment has never been higher. There's a generational injustice that we're going to be highlighting. But one of the things that was tangential, one of the things that usually we would vote for a national demo and then a few months later I'd name a day. I hadn't even left the building and I was getting tweeted at, name a day, <laughs> name the day. Um, in terms of, yeah. I think your question was about activism, I guess. Yeah, activism has absolutely changed by its nature and it is no longer just about walking down streets with placards. It's still an important part of manifesting activism. But actually, the, the student that hits the like button on the Facebook group, the, the student that fills in the website, that sends the, e the email to their MP, that we get students all the time to tweet at their MPs because, one, that is activism, but two, actually, when you get tweeted at, it feels very personal. It's actually a very effective way of campaigning. So, yes, that w one of the things we are trying to cope with and internally within our membership is say, hang on, guys, it's not all about demonstrations and protests. There are different ways to be an activist. Um, that's not to say the demo and protests aren't great and uh, don't have their time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and uh, finally, um, you know, as the fees are rising uh, and there's that kind of thing that's happening at the moment, what would you, you know, what would you think the future holds for the students at the moment? Um, and how would you feel that it's going to change? As, you know, what do you well, want to put on your, you know... As so, on a very, very basic level, Mm -hmm. uh, first thing up, there will be another review of higher education in at least five years' time because this current system is not sustainable. It costs the government more money, not less, um, and not just in higher education. That uh, One of the interesting commentaries at the moment is that tuition fees falls within the basket of how you calculate the Consumer Price Index, CPI. Now, CPI affects how much benefits you give in all sorts of areas across Treasury commitment. If you sharply increase tuition fees, you also affect that calculation of CPI. So one of the predictions is, potentially, we're going to break the budget across the board because benefits across the board might go up. Yeah. Remember that for every pound the government gives, it costs them at the moment 34 pence, and that's being optimistic. Um, the prediction by the Office of Budgetary Responsibility is that it won't be until 2047 that the amount going out from the Treasury is balanced by the amount coming in from student loans. 2047. You couldn't kick a ball into longer political grass yeah. than what the government's done with this system. So the first thing up is we will have another debate about how universities are funded in five years' time. We've got to be ready for that. Right. Second thing is, I, I think people think at the moment, the, the government's current policy pretty much tries to make a, a, a polarise the sector. And I'm not sure what side of the line Bournemouth would fall in that, to be honest. There are those who will be able to attract the 9k fees and charge that level. And they'll actually be quite safe if not have more money. 
And then there's those that will be forced to try and have low attrition fees because the government can't afford it. And I, I don't know where Bournemouth might end up. The other thing that's really interesting about in the future is that there's work going on just now to try and put, to, to say what the graduate premium is for every individual institution. So if I go to Oxford, I'm going to get a lot more money over my lifetime than if I go to University of East of London. Yeah. Um, that, that's an average, of course, not for individuals. But as soon as you know that, if I'm sitting there as something like the Royal Bank of Scotland, H, HSBC, whatever bank, I'd be thinking I could cash in on that. If I go to an institution where I know that graduates will get lots of money over their lifetime, then I can create a financial product that looks like a student loan. Yeah, yeah. You couldn't do it for Bournemouth because right. the terms and conditions couldn't be that generous. A bank isn't going to subsidise this stuff. And so one of my worries is if this system lasts much longer, we'll get all sorts of private providers coming in, whether they be financial or educational providers, and the sector could just look like some horrific mishmash of private institutions 10 years down the line. So lots to be worried about. Right. Liam, thank you very much for coming to Nerve Radio. Thanks for your time. Thanks for speaking to the students. Cheers.